So we've seen quite a, a range of films, really, I think, and, and quite um, proud, confident films, not without humour, as we've <laughs> seen. Um, at, at times poignant, but largely celebratory. Um, and I, I find this quite interesting because this is Glasgow of the 1930s, a Glasgow that was hard hit by the Depression. Yeah. Um, perhaps you could say a bit, Ruth, about, yeah, about these um, films. about how they came about, mm. especially. Um, they were actually inspired by John Grierson's films, um, Drifters and Nightmare. Um, and basically, Walter Elliott, the Secretary of State for Scotland at the time, wanted to make films that were kind of proud Scottish films that would boost morale. Um, obviously, Scotland had just come out of the Depression, so something that would capture all aspects of Scotland. So we have health, we have agriculture, we have everything in these films. And basically, um, Forsyth Hardy, who was, um, I think he was programmer for BBC at the time for, Scot for Scotland, um, advised on the committee as well. So it was set up with um, John Grierson overseeing um, the um, production of these seven films. And, you know, they, they were run at the Empire Exhibition in one of the pavilions um, on a kind of loop. So people, there was over 12 million people who actually probably did see these films. Um, and afterwards, they did go on general release in cinemas as well. Mm. Lawrence, you actually worked with John Grierson, so you're best placed to tell us, perhaps. Yes, yes, I did. The... Uh, I had the good fortune to uh, work with him when uh, Scottish television began. And I was with him for three years, and it was like being at a university for one. Uh, he was a remarkable, remarkable man. And uh, these films, uh, the earlier uh, you know, before I met him, when he was working, uh, the foundation of documentary, and he wanted these films to uh, give a very positive image of Scotland. Uh, he had great difficulty with the British Council, who didn't like. He, they wanted, you know, tartan and heather and uh, you know bagpipes and the the usual Scottish stuff, whereas he wanted for the Empire Exhibition, but also for the uh, the World Fair that was coming up in New York. He wanted this image of Scotland to be seen and appreciated, the kind of images we've seen uh, uh, this evening. In this room is a, a map of Scotland, mountain, loch, and glen. We want you to get to know that country and what is equally important to get to know the people who dwell there and understand their point of view. Our great Scottish cities are peculiarly favourably situated. Glasgow claims to be the second city in the empire and yet within 30 miles is the gateway to the western highlands and Loch Lomond in all her beauty lies as yet unspoilt by exploitation. What does the Empire Exhibition signify, or, or what's it communicating to the I, world? I, I think it was cited in Glasgow because, I mean, I, I was born in Glasgow in 1928. I went to secondary school the day the, the war broke out, virtually. <laughs> and uh, the, the Glasgow I grew up in was full of unemployment. It was, it was grimy, it was busy, there was a lot going on, but uh, there was an awful lot of unemployment. And I think the intention in putting, citing the Empire Exhibition in Glasgow uh, was to try and reinvigorate Glasgow as well. The River Clyde provides another grand outlet to scenic beauty and a fresh air. For an industrial city of its immense size, Glasgow is truly blessed in the richness and in the accessibility of its surrounding playgrounds. Uh, the exhibition was, it, it was commissioned in 1936 and Tate, Thomas Tate was the architect of the Empire Exhibition. He was appointed architect in chief. They'd said that there wasn't time for a competition so they just went ahead and appointed Thomas Smith Tate. Uh, but he was actually a very logical choice because he immediately decided to use what he described as not the old medieval form of architecture. Well, essentially, if you've got an exhibition to build, which you produce the master plan in February 1937, and by May the 3rd, 1938, you're opening an exhibition with 150 buildings in it, the largest of which covered five acres, the tallest of which was 300 feet high, there is no way that you can use traditional techniques. I can't 
emphasise this strongly enough. You are building a town in 15 months. 18 months from the first drawings to execution. Opening on the 3rd of May, royal opening, lots of fanfare. And the Glasgow exhibition of 1938 was actually complete when it opened, which, you know, might, you know, it, it, it would almost seem to be what you would expect. It hadn't happened in Paris the year before. It hadn't happened in Wembley in 1924. So Glasgow actually opening its exhibition, which was the largest of all of these, on time with this fantastic display of modern architecture, but also, you know, the most fountains and water displays that had ever been used before, fantastic lighting displays, it opened until 11 o'clock at night. So you'd go along at night time, and as Andy said, you know, this grimy city, and then you walk through the gates of Bella Houston Park, you've paid your shilling, and you're somewhere that is infinitely superior to Disneyland.